Assalamualaikum and good day to everyone. My name is Husna Zulkifli. Uh, so we meet again and we are still in chapter 4. So our topic for today is about protein. So proteins are the most abundant molecules that can be found in living organisms. For example, in human, protein can be found in skin, hair, nails and also muscles. So basically, the molecules of proteins are composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and sometimes can contain sulfur, phosphorus and also iron. The word protein comes from a Greek word, proteos, meaning primary. So primary here means might be referring to the abundancy and the significant roles of protein in living organisms. So from the diagram here, you can see that the monomer or the subunit of protein is amino acid. So these amino acids are linked together forming the polymer called polypeptide. And the chain of polypeptides folded and coiled into a specific conformation and will be called as a protein. Here is the structure of an amino acid which is the monomer or subunit of a protein. So basically an amino acid consists of a central carbon or also known as the alpha carbon. So attached to this carbon is the basic amino group and then it has an acidic carboxyl group and also a hydrogen atom. So on the other side of the carbon it has R group or also known as R side chain. So the function of the R group is to determine the amino acid identity whether it is acidic, basic, polar or also non-polar amino acid. So here is one example of amino acid where we have a central carbon and then here is the amino group, the carboxyl group and the hydrogen atom. So we replace the R uh, side chain or R group with hydrogen and then we have glycine amino acid. The slide here is to show different types of amino acid and one way to classify them is based on the side chain or the R group's properties. Generally, there are 20 amino acids and they are divided into two main groups which are amino acid with non-polar side chains and the other one is amino acid with polar side chains. So amino acid with non-polar side chains are hydrophobic molecules which means these molecules tend to repel water while amino acid with polar side chains are the hydrophilic molecules which means they are water-loving molecules. So now take a look at the side chain of this non-polar amino acid and notice that they have similarities in the composition. So they, they, they contain hydrocarbon molecules which are the main cause of the hydrophobic effect of these amino acids. While in the polar amino acid, so the side chain may contain oxygen or sulfur atom and this may cause um, partial negative charge on one side of the molecules and can attract water hence the hydrophilic effect okay apart from that amino acids are also classified based on the electrically charged side chain so this can be divided into acidic and basic amino acid. So in acidic amino acids, so the side chains usually have carboxylic acid as part of their side chain. While in the basic amino acid, so the side chain usually has nitrogen atoms which is known for the chemical properties of base. Amino acid can also be classified on the basis of nutrition. So they can be classified as 
either essential amino acids or non-essential amino acids. Uh, either two types of these amino acids, both are important uh, as they are required for the body growth. So what is essential amino acids? So these are the amino acids that cannot be synthesized within the body. So we must get them from the diet. While non-essential amino acids, so this type of amino acids can be synthesized within our body. Okay, another thing that you should know about amino acids, uh, these molecules are known as amphoteric molecules. So what is amphoteric molecule? Uh, they are molecules that can act as acid and basic at the same time. So amino acid is amphoteric molecules because of the presence of amino group and carboxyl group. So this amino group will ionize and act as base to a set proton while the carboxyl group will ionize and act as acid to donate proton. So we are finished with the monomer or amino acids. In order to produce larger molecules or protein, this amino acid need to be linked. To start with, uh, two amino acids are linked by a peptide bond through condensation process. So what actually happened here is carboxyl group from one amino acid will react with amino group from another amino acid to form peptide bond. So these two amino acids now are known as dipeptide and from this condensation process, one water molecule is produced. So from those two amino acids just now linked together through peptide bond, more and more amino acids are added and finally it will form a polypeptide chain. We are already up to polypeptide. So now how does this polypeptide becomes a protein? But before that, let's have a look at some general characteristic of a protein. Basically, a typical protein consists of one or more polypeptide chains which helps in variety of bonds. For example, hydrogen bond, ionic bond, hydrophobic interactions and disulfide bonds. So, this protein varies in shapes and sizes. They could either be globular or fibrous. And these shapes or conformation of protein contributes to its function. So how does this protein get the shape or conformation? This will actually depend on the four levels of protein structure that we'll discuss on the next slide. Four levels of protein structures and they are based on the complexity of the polypeptides. So the first, the simplest uh, structure of protein is the primary protein structure so this consists of amino acid sequence linked by peptide bond in a linear polypeptide chain so how does this amino acid sequence are uh, arranged actually they are based on genetic information in the dna next we have secondary protein structure so the secondary protein structure may present in two forms which are the alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. So this is due to the local folding and the structure are held by hydrogen bonds. Next we have tertiary protein structure. In this structure, there are 3D foldings that occurs due to the amino acid side chain interactions. So one important bond in this structure is the disulfide bond that keeps the structure in shape and attached to each other. And then we have the quaternary protein structure. So this type of protein structure consists more than one amino acid chain and uh, they have the same interaction as the tertiary uh, protein structure.
The abundance of protein uh, reflects their important roles in living organisms. So here are a few brief functions of proteins in our body system. So the first one, protein provide the structure framework. So this can be seen in collagen in skin and also keratin in hair or nails. Proteins also involved in the movement function for the body. So examples are such as uh, protein actin and myosin in the muscle contraction. Next, the function of protein is also uh, involved in defense mechanisms. So protein helps the body to form antibodies. So these antibodies will fight against foreign bodies or infections that uh, caused by bacteria or viruses. And apart from that, proteins also has uh, storage roles. So examples are such as protein ferritin uh, that stores iron in tissues. Uh, you can find more examples of uh, protein functions in the notes uh, and also from your textbook. Besides the different levels of structure that made up the protein's unique shapes of conformation, protein can also change shape by denaturation. So what exactly is denaturation? So this is a process of alteration or modification of protein shapes where this protein loses its high order structure which is the three dimensional structure but not the primary sequence or primary structure. Uh, so this process is due to the disruptions of bond in secondary, tertiary and quaternary protein structures. So there are many factors that can cause uh, denaturation such as heat, acid, alkali and also heavy metals. So denaturation can sometimes be reversible and this process is known as renaturation. However, some of the process uh, denaturations are permanent as seen in egg fried. So the first factor that can cause denaturation in protein is heat or UV radiation. So this heat can disrupt hydrogen bonds and also the non-polar hydrophobic interactions within the protein molecules. So this occurs uh, due to the fact that heat increases the kinetic energy and causes the molecules to vibrate rapidly and the, finally the bond will be disrupted. So for example here we see protein in eggs uh, denature and coagulate when cooking or applied to heat. So the heat causes the protein in the eggs to uncoil or denature and more heat will cause the protein strands to reform into a new bond and the egg will set to form a solid. So this process is known as coagulation. So besides heat, alcohol can also cause protein denaturation. So alcohol denatures protein by disrupting the side chain intramolecular hydrogen bond. And after that, new hydrogen bonds are formed between the alcohol molecules and the protein side chains. So as you can see in this diagram, this is the original um, side chain intramolecular hydrogen bond between these two amino acids within a protein molecule. So when we add uh, alcohol, so this alcohol will disrupt the side chain by forming new bond with a uh, respective amino acid. So this is the alcohol, so this is the amino acid and this is the new hydrogen bond between them. So the, the alcohol has disrupted the original hydrogen bond that initially are here between these two amino acids. Third factors that can cause protein denaturations are acids and bases. Basically, acid and bases will disrupt the salt bridges held together by ionic charges. Uh, for example, in this diagram, we have salt bridges between glutamic acid and lysine in a tertiary protein structure. So, this is the glutamic acid and this is the lysine. 
these are the charges that hold them together so when we add the denaturant so what will happen is the double replacement reaction for example here we add hydrochloric acid so the hydrogen ion from the acid will pair with glutamic acid while lysine will pair with the chloride ion from the denaturant so this will disrupt the original salt bridges examples are such as the one that occurs in the digestion system where the acidic gastric juices cause the milk to coagulate so heavy metals can also cause protein denaturations uh, these heavy metals can disrupt the disulfide bonds as they have high attraction for sulfur so disulfide bonds present in tertiary protein structure so these bonds are actually the bonds between uh, two sulfhydry group uh, in amino acid cysteine so how does this heavy metals affect the protein structure is they split the disulfide bond and add hydrogen atom to form thiols group so apart from that uh, heavy metals also disrupt the salt bridges by forming ionic bonds with negatively charged group uh, this one is as i've mentioned uh, in the previous slide as mentioned just now denaturation process are reversible and this process is known as renaturation so this happens once the denaturants are removed so this denatured protein will return to their normal conformation or native conformation and their biological functions will be restored so this renaturation process does not only occur on proteins but they could also occur on complementary strands of nucleic acids Some proteins fail to renature to their native conformation due to a few factors. For example, here, the protein may fall temporarily as it is produced, meaning that this protein uh, actually function on specific period of time. And renature is also not possible if the process requires molecular chaperones or helper proteins. And the last factor could be due to the loss of prostatic group so prostatic group is actually the non-protein part of the complex uh, molecules which helps the protein to be fully functional